I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory. Days of darkness still come o'er me, sorrows pass, I often tread, but the Savior still is with me, by his hand I'm safely led. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, sing it with Good singing. Now I'm going to ask the pianist, what did I send? I think I put the wrong songs on here. What's the second song? The next page. Uh, the one, 539's in the bullet. I don't have a bulletin either. Um, 500. Let's go to 500. Thank you. You all are on the ball here. Save, save. So I'm going to ask you about the third one too because uh, I wrote my little notes down here and I think I put down the evening services all right, here we go. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. We'll get it all together here in a minute. Yeah. All right, hymn number 500. That uh, should be our first one, right? All right, so let's do 500 then. All right, hymn number 500. <laughs> taught long ago on that song you don't want to miss that word saved so I was trying to shout it bellow it as loud as I could and good to see you here this morning I hope you know that you're saved if not you can know that today it's good to be together and I pray and trust that you are doing well and it's a beautiful day outside we've had a beautiful weekend God has been so good he always is amen and uh, it's good to see you here and whether you're here every Sunday or it's your first time we're so glad that you decided to worship the Lord together with us today at Truth Baptist Church. I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, uh, yesterday uh, we learned that Israel had rockets and drones sent into their airspace, and uh, so there's a lot happening right now in the Middle East. As a matter of fact, airspace is shut down over top of Israel right now as we speak, as, as far as I know. So we need to pray for that area of the world. We need to pray for Israel and, uh, and all that relates to that. And uh, I don't want to forget that this morning. That's very, very important. And that's something we need to be watching daily. And uh, we, if you believe about prof prophecy the way I do, we understand the significance of all of that. But uh, let's just keep that in prayer and trust the Lord. 
And uh, I also wanted to mention that we need to pray uh, as we go in prayer today for little Caroline Oaks. She is having surgery Tuesday morning now. They moved that surgery up at Chippenham Hospital, 7.30, right, uh, on Tuesday morning. They're going to get there really early, around 5, 5.30. So let's, uh, it's good to see the Oaks here, but let's pray for little Caroline as well as the situation in Israel. And I know there's other things that we're thinking about and praying about as well. But these two things uh, are on the forefront of my mind and heart. So I want to think about these things as we pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for this church and the opportunity we have to worship together and to gather in this place. The singing has just been tremendous. Thank you for how it's lifted my heart already. And thank you for Brother Greg leading us in, uh, Lord, just such a, a powerful way. And Lord, I ask that... You would be with us and with our our country, with our world. We pray for the situation happening over in the Middle East right now. And Lord, uh, I I believe even now there's still, uh, Lord, hostility that's taking place. And there's rockets and drones and, uh, Lord, uh, an assault that's taking place over in that part of the world. And we just ask that your will would be done there. We pray, Lord, uh, for safety. We pray, Lord, for people who might not know you to turn to you and come to a saving knowledge of you before it might be too late. And so, Lord, we ask for your will to be done. And, Lord, may we look to that uh, with all of its significance and just ultimately trust you because we know that you're in control. Lord, we do pray for little Caroline, and we ask, Lord, that you would have your hand on her as she faces surgery Tuesday morning. And we pray that you would be with the doctors and be with Caroline, and I pray that you would guide the doctor's hands and that that surgery would be successful and that the blockage there uh, in her uh, digestive tract could be removed and uh, successfully. And I pray that it would be as, as less invasive or as least invasive as it can possibly be. And we'll ask, Lord, for uh, it to be a, a great outcome and a great result. And uh, be with the Oaks, calm them. May we all look to you in this time and just surround and bathe uh, the oaks in prayer, as well as many others we're thinking about and praying about this morning. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask our ushers if they would come forward. And they have in their hand a visitor welcome card and a pen. And uh, if you are visiting today for the very first time, we want to give you a hearty welcome and say we are so glad that you are here. So right now, as our Uh, ushers are making their way down the aisle. If you are here for the first time, don't hesitate to just raise your hand briefly. We want to say hello to you, and we'd like to get you this card. We ask that you fill out all the information on the card in just a moment as the offering plate is uh, passed around. We would ask that you just set that in the offering plate, that visitor card, and that way we can make a record of your visit. My wife Heather and I are always out in the lobby after the service. We would love to have that opportunity to get to say hello to you and meet you if we've never had that opportunity before. So, Uh, We hope we get that opportunity to meet you, especially if you're here for the first time. You're our honored guest, and thank you for being with us. Uh, Greg, I think I'm going to borrow your uh, bulletin, if that's okay. And uh, there's a lot there. He came prepared, I didn't. So (laughs) it's good to have a wingman, you know what I mean? And uh, so thank you, Greg, for that. But uh, there are several things that I just, I didn't want to miss some of the things that are here. One of the ones, uh, of the announcements that are here in the uh, bulletin is the first one that you'll see. It's Operation Caldrop. Now, when we announce something like this, this might bring some confusion. Why is a church advertising a Caldrop? What is that all about? What does that mean? And, uh, and really what it is, is it's a big community event that we have an opportunity to represent our church at. Just like the Tomato Festival and other events that we've done in the past. Uh, we want to be as a part of as many of those as we can as a church because the more we're out in the public and the more we have the opportunity to mix with uh, our community and share the gospel, most importantly, with them, the more impactful we will be. And so we are going to have a booth there at Operation Caldrop. It is actually a partnership of Chick-fil-A and Grace Christian School that is coming together and it's, it's a fundraiser for the Christian school. But as a part of that, they're doing this big community event where at the end 
Uh, they're going to drop all these little stuffed cows out of a helicopter on parachutes. And, uh, you know, that's just pretty exciting. I, I, you know, now, if it was a real cow, I'd really be excited. But I'll take little, <laughs> I'll take little stuffed cows. You know, but here's the most important thing. It's just going to be a fun day. You know, there's going to be all kinds of things to do. There'll be, uh, I think it says 45 different vendors. We're one of them. So we're going to have a booth set up with tracks uh, with information about our VBS. We really want to promote our VBS because there's going to be a lot of young families and a lot of children there. And uh, yes, there'll be a lot of the Grace Christian School family there, but there'll be a ton of people from the community as well. And uh, we just want to have a presence. And they were so thrilled that we... Uh, we're going to be one of their vendors, and so they were happy to have us be one of them. As a matter of fact, they even gave me a sign and said, "Would you? You're right on the busy road. Would you please put your uh, one of our signs out?" And I said, "I'd be happy to." So that's the sign that you see. So yes, uh, it's a partnership with Chick Fil A and Grace Christian School in order to be a fundraiser for the school. But most importantly, it's just a community event that we get to be at. So remember that. And then also, uh, don't forget about MSEF donations. That's every third Sunday. So that's next Sunday. Uh, remember that. Bring non-perishable foods and hygiene supplies. Those are great uh, things to add to that. It's kind of like a mini food pantry that we have, but it's not here. It gets collected here, and then Mrs. Purcell brings that over to MSEF, which stands for Mechanicsville Church's Emergency Functions. We have a great partnership with them, and uh, really it's just a, it's a wonderful thing that we have here in our community, and it acts as really a free grocery store. And uh, if you've never been there, I'd encourage you to go look, and you can uh, schedule an appointment. You can talk to Wendy Purcell. But it is just a, a great thing that they have going over there. And that's why we have this food bank out here. Every month we collect a number of non-perishable food items uh, in addition to other things like hygiene supplies. And at different times of the year, they need more supplies than others. And we try to mention that. But uh, next Sunday, we'll try to have those things turned in. And we'll turn it in for April. And then we'll start it again in May and so on and so forth. So just we want to kind of keep that uh, in front of you periodically and remember that. And then the ladies brunch is going to be happening here in just a couple more weeks. That's going to be Saturday, April 27th at 10 a.m. All ladies are invited to our annual brunch, enjoy refreshments and fellowship. And in addition to the ladies brunch, we're going to combine that with a card shower uh, for Jasmine Yeager. So remember that as well. It'll just be a, an important time, but also just a fun time for our ladies together. We want to encourage you to be a part of that. There is a sign-up sheet. And we're asking if you come to bring a brunch type of item and sign up what you'll be bringing. So kind of remember that. I think sometimes we mentally plan to do things and then we just forget to sign up or we forget to write our name down. So if you can help us with that, that'd be great. All right, we're going to have our ushers come forward. Remember to come back tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to hear from Brother Chris Verrett again. He started us in the Book of Ruth last Sunday night. And uh, we're excited about that beginning or continuing again tonight. And uh, he will be in chapter 2 of Ruth, and I'm excited to hear the continuing story. And uh, there is romance in the Bible. It really is. And uh, you don't have to go to other places to find it. You can find it right in the Word of God. And it's an awesome love story. So, Chris, I'm glad you're preaching it, all right? And uh, so, anyhow, it'll be good, and uh, looking forward to hearing from him. Uh, we are going to collect our morning offering now. I'm going to ask Brother Richard Johnson if he'd pray for the offering, please.
Thank you, Holly, for that offertory. Let's take our hymn books now, turn to hymn number 539, and we'll stand and sing this, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, hymn number 539. 539, as we stand, we'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verse. This morning, let's do our course now. We'll sing through the first verse, then we'll turn around and shake hands and come back. We'll sing through the second verse or through the fourth verse. Of In Christ alone, my hope is He is my, my strength, my song. This Lord, our soul. greet one another now.
As we make our way back to our seats, let's sing the fourth verse up here. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life that cry to final breath, Jesus commanded destiny. Good singing. You may be seated. alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence, that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand. Sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above of the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ our open life and death. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him, there we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal, oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death, oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal, oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. I want to dismiss our young people, age five up through fifth grade. They can be dismissed, age five up through fifth grade. 
Hallelujah is all throughout that special. I think of praise the Lord. That's what that word means. It brings me back to the junior church days and the VBS days. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. And uh, a lot of fun. And uh, believe it or not, VBS will be here middle of July. You might think that's so far off. No, it's not. It'll be here before you realize it. So a lot of things that are on the horizon that we're looking forward to. But uh, we can look to the Lord and say, praise be to him because of who he is and what he means to us. We are in Psalm 37 this morning. Psalm 37. In this year, 2024, we've taken as our theme the phrase from Hebrews chapter number 10, and so much the more. And we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as we see the day approaching, uh, but, uh, but so much the more we are to be gathering together, so much the more um, coming together and uh, meeting for the purpose of getting into God's word and uh, centering our lives around him. And we're not to be doing less of that as we get closer to that day, we're to be doing more of that. And I love that phrase, as you see the day approaching. Can we not see the day approaching every day? As we look into what's happening in current events and around the world, can we not see that day approaching? Oh, we certainly can. And, uh, and what are we to do? You know, that's always sometimes the question. Pastor, what are we to do? Well, we're to keep being the church, and we're to continue to spread the truth and to live out our faith, not less, but ever so the more. And uh, so I've taken that theme. I, I was finishing Matthew for the first part of this year, uh, but starting last year or last week, we looked at a more meaningful walk with the Lord. And I'm just taking that word more, and I'm applying it in a different way for the next few weeks. This week, I'm thinking about this, more fulfillment, more fulfillment. We're in Psalm 37. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. This is a psalm of David, and it's a powerful psalm, and there's some very clear directives to follow if we are to be people who are living more fulfilled lives. Let's look at it. Psalm 37, beginning in verse 1. There the Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. And forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us to truly understand what it means to live contented and fulfilled lives. We need that. And I know, Lord, that you want that for us. You've called us to live in such a way. And so I pray that we would apply what we hear. I ask that this message would not only be doctrinal, but that it would be practical and that it would speak directly to the heart. Help us to understand what these commands are in this passage and how they apply to our lives. And I pray that we would leave here determined to live more fulfilled and more contented as the believers you've called us to be. Help us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If we're honest... Much of our world, and even some of those in the family of God, live unfulfilled lives. And we can look at the world around us and understand why that's the case. 
But honestly, that should never be the case with God's people. The Lord has called us to life, and according to His Word, life more abundantly. God wants us to live abundant Christian lives. Uh, Lives that are full and lives that have meaning and purpose. Uh, We have not uh, been called to live just an existence that's ho-hum, drum, and so whatever it is, you know, I'm just existing in this world. Oh no, listen, if we know God is our Father, if we've been saved, if we've had our sins forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we've been called to so much more. And our lives should be fulfilled. Unfortunately, oftentimes, rather than living a fulfilled, quality life, it's replaced by fear. It's a life replaced by anxiety, self-pity, and sometimes overall discontentment. And whether we realize it or not, it's not God's plan for us to live a brooding, disgruntled, and unhappy existence. Now, when I was in college, I worked for a company called Publishers Circulation Fulfillment. And the whole premise of the company was to cause people to think that there was a publication that they didn't have but that if they did have it, it would greatly fulfill their lives. Thus the name, Publishers Circulation Fulfillment. That published, uh, you know, that, that published paper was the New York Times. And so our job was to sell the New York Times all over the country. And I was going into my senior year of college, and I was working towards an engagement ring. And uh, I needed to get an engagement ring to put on Heather's hand because I was going to ask her hand in marriage right after we graduated. So engagement rings, if you, you know, get a real one, you know, not the kind just out of a little, you know, coin, uh, coin canister uh, event right outside of the grocery store. If you want to get something real, you have to work for it. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to work towards this. And uh, so I worked for that. And for hours, most weeknights, I would go to this call center and I would call and I would cause people to believe when I was on the phone that they were missing out because they did not have the New York Times. And you might think that might have been hard to do. Sometimes it was, you know, especially when you're calling Texas and other places telling them they need the New, the New York Times. They told me a few things in return that I, you know, I won't repeat, but anyhow, uh, I, I did succeed at causing some people to think they were missing out by not having this paper. And I worked upon them being caused to to feel that they were unfulfilled because they didn't have it. But we could fulfill that by a subscription and sending it their way, and it could be sent to them in a matter of a few days. And what did it do? It worked off of people's feeling discontented. Now, again, God doesn't want us to live that kind of an existence. Discontented, unfulfilled unhappy. I think sometimes some of God's people think that the grumpier you are, the more spiritual you are, you know? And some people, I don't know, they just walk in and, uh, you know, stern, stoic face, not going to give a smile, you know? And, uh, and, you know, after a while, you just wonder, is there, is there a happy bone in there, you know? Is there any kind of sunshine in that person's soul? Is, is, is there any reason at all to be happy, And uh, I'll tell you, as God's people, we should be happy. And and we should walk into church with a bright countenance. And listen, I understand some of us go through hard things. But we can all meet together here as the church of God. And we can find a reason to rejoice. Because we're worshiping the one who loves us. And we're worshiping the one who honestly can give to us eternal life. And a relationship with him that can... uh, That can set us on a direction uh, that will be a life truly fulfilled. And you need that in life. We all need that. In our text, the psalmist David warns to fret not three different times. Now, we live in a world that is full of fear and full of anxiety, and it just seems like on every turn there's something to be worried about. Or there's something to be concerned about. And man, I hear it all the time. I mean, more in the last five years than I can remember ever in my life. People are afraid of this and 
people are afraid of that. And pastor, I, I, don't, I don't know what we're going to do and, and, and what's happening in this world and what does it mean for us. And, and, and it seems like some folks are afraid to even leave their home or leave their neighborhood or go anywhere or do anything. And I just want to encourage you, listen up, Christian. God doesn't want you to live fearful. God doesn't want you to live anxious. He's not called you to that. The word fret here in this passage literally means to glow or grow warm. In the context, it specifically can be applied to our own displeasure, to be incensed. And maybe we find ourselves in this place, or we're tempted to find ourselves in this place from time to time. But from these verses, we observe several actions to follow that I think will take us from a lack of fulfillment to real lasting fulfillment in our lives. That first fret not is in regard to evildoers. Now let's look at the text. I hope you have your Bible because this is not about what I'm saying this morning. It's about what God's word says. Notice what verse one tells us. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. We live in a world that is full of evil. We live in a world that is full of workers of iniquity. People who are are, are living out wicked lives. And God's word tells us specifically, don't be fearful because of that. Don't be anxious because of that. You can spend your whole life and you can fret it away and you can be scared of everything, but that's not living the life of a believer that I've called you to live. So very clearly, the command is fret not thyself because of the evil in this world or the evil doers around you. Listen, God has a plan for all of it. And in the end, the Lord takes care of it all. And in this life, we're going to see evil. We're going to see wickedness. But don't live anxious, fearful lives because of it. God has a formula then for us to follow. What is it to do? What, what is it that we are to do? Well, verse 2 tells us those who are evildoers, they're going to be cut down like the grass. And they're going to wither as the green herb. They're going to have their day. And we're going to have our day. And those who are wicked and who reject the Lord, they're going to pay an ultimate penalty for that. That shouldn't make us happy. That should make us grieved. And we are. But here's how we are to live. Notice verse 3. Trust in the Lord. The first thought to living a more fulfilled life is to trust in the Lord. Now, you know, we say it so often that I think sometimes we don't even consider it. Trust in the Lord, but do you? Can I just ask the question, do you really? Do any of us really trust God? Do we trust God with the meeting we have tomorrow morning at work? Some of you will grind your teeth tonight over a meeting or something that's going to happen tomorrow morning at work, but we need to leave it with God. By the way, I'm guilty myself over some things. I wake up sometimes and I'm literally biting into my tongue. And I Googled that, you know? Because Google tells you everything these days, isn't it? And I've, I kept biting into my tongue so much, and I Googled, why, why, am I, why am I waking up biting into my tongue? And people that do that usually grind their teeth in their sleep. So I thought to myself, maybe I need to trust God more and grind my teeth in my sleep less. Maybe I need to be a little more trusting. And I need to trust in the one who can do something about whatever it is I'm facing, whether it's a difficult meeting, whether it's a difficult situation, uh, whether it might be something that's completely out of my control, because many times it is, and I just need to say, God, I can trust you. Some have said that the idea of trust in this verse literally means to be lying face down in total vulnerability with no other options. Now, most of us don't ever put ourselves in that place, but we can trust in God. Think about those who, in God's word, had to do this. I think about men like Joseph, Peter, Paul, and others down through history in God's word who were literally in prison for their faith. And at that point in time, you have nothing else you can do other than simply trust in God. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 tells us very clearly, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So we have to trust God. That's where it begins for us. Let me encourage you, if there's something that's happening in your life that, that concerns you, that makes you fearful, it's time to give it over to God this morning. 
It's time to say, Lord, I'm not harboring this any longer. I've held on to it for too long. It keeps me asleep. Or, <laughs> asleep. It keeps me awake at night. It keeps me grinding my teeth at night. It, it, it keeps me, uh, you know, without an appetite. It, it's hurting me and it's hurting my ability to function. And so I'm going to give it over to you. And some of us need to start there. But notice the second part of the verse. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. There is another part of that, and that's do right. We are not to withdraw. We are not to retreat or go into a tailspin when things get difficult. But rather, we're to trust God and then move forward and get busy doing right. It's been said, do right till the stars fall, and even if they do, continue to do right. Our job is to do the right thing and to choose not between the good and the bad, but the good and the best, and to always choose the best. Do the right thing. Now, that seems elementary, but you'd be surprised how in vulnerable moments, many times, we're tempted not to do the right thing, and we very well may not. If we're not determined beforehand, I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to do right no matter what. And I might have someone in my face strongly trying to convince me to do wrong, but I'm going to do right anyhow. And I might feel peer pressure from friends or family and others to believe the wrong way or do the wrong thing, but between me and the Lord, I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to choose right when I'm given the opportunity. I will do the right thing. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said, and I, I think it's great. He said, doing good is a fine remedy for fretting. There is a joy and holy activity which drives away the rust of discontentment. Let me say it again. Doing good is a fine remedy for fretting. There is a joy and holy activity which drives away the rust of of discontentment. Uh, if you want to start living more contented and more fulfilled in this life, listen, start doing what God's Word says. Start being obedient. Determine that I'm going to do right. You know, doing right goes beyond just coming to church Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. That's one aspect of doing right. You made the right choice on a Sunday morning. And it's a beautiful day out. You could have chose to do a lot of other things, but you saw the importance of being here. That's a good decision. Now, I would say this, build upon that and make another good decision later today. And make another good decision tomorrow and, and say, I want to know what God tells me to do. And if God's word says it, I'm going to do it. If God's word instructs me in a certain way, that's how I'm going to go. I hear this all the time, more than you would expect. I hear believers even say to me, yeah, oh no, I know that you know, God's word says these, but the way I feel about it is, it, it, it doesn't matter how we feel about it. Can I just say that this morning? Will you allow me to be direct with you? It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It does matter what God's word says about it. Amen? We may feel all types of different ways. You know? We may feel like different things at different times. I had a dream the other night that I was a soldier. And maybe with Trent being in the army, I'm thinking all these things. And I mean, I was in war, and I was battling, I was fighting. And you ever had a dream so real, you wake up, you still think it's real? And I woke up, and I was waking up, and I, I woke up giving commands, and I was, you know, I felt like I was carrying a rifle, and I was getting up, going around. I made my way to the bathroom like I was marching, and then I had to realize, wait a minute, I'm Eric Hastings, the pastor of Truth Baptist. I'm not a soldier. I'm going to lay down my imaginary weapon and go back to bed. Sometimes we feel all kinds of things that aren't true or aren't real. We might feel one way one day and another day the next, another thing the next day. It, but what is true and what is right? And what are we to do with our lives? Secondly, here's another aspect of this. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. So trust in the Lord and do good. Now notice what verse 4 says. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now as I say this phrase, delight thyself in the Lord, yes, there is an aspect of being happy in Jesus. Okay? But it's not as simple as that. 
We just like to make everything light and airy and fluffy and yay, be happy in Jesus and then I'll all be good. You know? But that's not reality. And as we study the word delight, I want to help you with something. We often kind of get this a little bit wrong. We sometimes think the word delight here means just be a happy Christian and you'll get everything your little heart desires. And be happy in the Lord and try to smile when things are difficult and just be a happy little Christian, you know. You know I, who's the artist? Happy Little Trees. And, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to, what is it? Bob Ross. We have, we have a Bob Ross approach, you know. Happy Little Trees. And we sometimes think, just be a happy little Christian. I'll be a happy little Christian. And everything's going to go well. And that's just, that, that's not where real living takes place, okay? So let me, let me help us with something. Here's what the word delight means. It is the Hebrew word onag. And it means this, to be soft or pliable, luxurious. Okay? Now, one of the most precious, luxurious metals that we have is gold, and it's very soft. It is pliable. Uh, as a matter of fact, it can be stretched far. If you were to heat it and stretch it, it can be stretched far longer than you would ever imagine. Uh, it, it is an incredible, precious, soft, pliable metal, and that adds great value to it. And here's what the verse is actually communicating. We are to make ourselves soft, pliable, luxurious to the master's will. And then his desires will become our desires as he further molds and shapes us into his image. So when the Bible says, delight thyself also in the Lord, yes, be happy in the Lord, but it's so much deeper than that. You are happy in the Lord as you make yourself soft, pliable, luxurious to his master's hand. Are you that in his hand? You see, here's the problem where I think Christians lack contentment and fulfillment. They're not soft or pliable. And yes, they have a certain approach, and they believe if I can just do this or that, I'll be happy, and then God tries to start working on them, and they're rigid, and they can't be molded as they need to be. And therefore, it's all about them and their will. It's us and our will and not God's will because we just haven't really given ourselves over and say, God, whatever you want me to do, you can do it. You have me and all of me, and I'm soft and pliable to you and your will. Oh, we want our will. We want what we want to do. We want to go our directions about what I've always thought or what I've always believed or surely this could be what needs to happen. And God says, no, you're, you're really rigid right here and you're not delighting yourself in me. In this year of so much the more, I would encourage you, would you just determine to make yourself soft and pliable and luxurious to the master's will rather than your own? Because when you do, life will become much more fulfilling. You know, I love, I love it when believers look at church as not something just to show up to once in a while, but it's something that they live out. You know, we live it. And it's about our life. It's not just about something we do every once in a while. We live this life. And it's exciting to see a church, which is a group of people that is a called out assembly of baptized believers and, and believe in, of course, saved baptized believers that come together to do God's will. And, and that's a family right there. That's not just some group that gets together every once in a while. It's the family of God. And when people start to think that way and say, you know, I'm a part of a family, I'm going to adjust myself so that I can live in that family properly. It's exciting what God can do in the midst of that. Yesterday we had men's prayer meeting. and You know, I get a special joy in my heart as I observe things and see things that you can only see in a church family. First of all, just a group of men getting together and being encouraging around the things of God and praying about things, that, that only happens in the church. And... 
Yeah, I know that people can meet here and there at different times and have own, their own get-togethers, but there's, there's something special about the church. The Lord says he get, died and gave himself for the church. The church needs a priority. And it was an encouraging thing to share some requests and to share some praises. And I said, hey, fellas, um, when we're done, we need to do some cleaning up around here, you know? And you know what? A bunch of fellas just jumped right in and started doing some cleaning. And uh, Pop came up here and got the upper bathrooms, and Chris and the deacons and, uh, and, and Mike uh, started working on the lower bathrooms. Now, when you start asking people to do that, you know, it's like in a family situation, hey, take out the trash. There's like a little bit of resistance sometimes. But you know what helps us get over the hump in the family of God? Hey, this is all about Jesus anyhow. And then we finish up some donuts. I don't know if that's about Jesus or not, but that's something we do as men. And we finished up the donuts, and uh, there was a little bit of time, and uh, Brandon said, hey, I got about 10 minutes before I got to go. What can I do? And so I gave him a vacuum, and he started vacuuming. I almost took a picture and to send it to Tova to see, is this something he does at home? I, I don't know. But he was doing it at least here to vacuum up some things. And then Gavin uh, said, hey, because uh, earlier I said we need to blow some leaves out on the parking lot. And, and Steve had gotten here earlier before men's permit even started to cut the entire lawn so it looks nice today. And Gavin said, hey, let me uh, see if I can blow some leaves. So we put that big old pack on them. He's getting ready for next year's wrestling season anyway, so we put it on him, and he took that thing, and he's starting to blow leaves for just about 10 minutes. And, uh, and then they left, and then uh, Stephen finished up, and then I realized, you know what, I, wanna, I don't know if I just caught the bug or what, but I wanted to blow leaves too. And Steve did a good job, but I still saw all the little detailed parts that I wanted to get. So you know what? I just went ahead and put the pack on myself, and I started blowing leaves. And I look over, and I see Johnny shooting baskets, and I see Deacon Doug come up behind Johnny, and he's showing Johnny. Now, Doug, you're not 70 yet, right? You're not 70 yet. Okay, good. I didn't think you were. But an om- somewhere between uh, upper 60-ish type of uh, fella, one of our deacons, comes up to my son and he's showing him how to shoot baskets and now that's not his grandpa that's not even someone who's related to him biologically in this world but that is actually a brother in Christ and a 60 plus some odd age man can interact with a 12 year old boy and show him how to get his form right shooting baskets and I'm blowing leaves and I'm just enjoying everything that I'm witnessing in the family of God on a Saturday morning what is it it's all about it's the church it's being pliable to what God wants now listen I, I understand if you didn't make it on Saturday morning as a man or boy doesn't mean you're wicked or anything like that I'm just saying it's a wonderful thing when there's a heart that says sure I can go to men's prayer meeting sure I can jump in and help do this or that because after all we're the family of God and, and it's about Jesus and serving him anyhow what is that? That's delighting in the Lord. And special things happen when you delight in the Lord. Here's the third thing. I've got to go quick. Commit your way to the Lord. The word commit in verse 5 literally means to roll on to. As you make yourself soft and pliable uh, to the Lord, you'll find out that there is going to be some issues that creep up and things that happen in our life that might try to hinder our activity for the Lord and he says don't worry or fret just roll that right on me verse 5 commit thy way unto the Lord trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass Uh, there is so much that's out of our hands and because of that we just have to have that approach every day where we say I'm going to roll this on to the Lord I'm committing my way to God, and as I commit my way to God, I'm trusting Him with this situation and with that situation, and it's beyond my control, but but Lord, I'm rolling it on to You. I'm going to commit my way to You. I'm going to go the way that You have told me to go. Psalm 55, 22 says this, (coughs) Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us that we are to be casting all our care upon him, for he careth for thee. The Lord can handle it. He says, commit it unto me. I'll take it. Commit your way to the way I've directed you. Man, we have to get off our own way sometimes and 
really all the time and just say, Lord, it's not my way, it's not my will, it's yours. And when I have something I can't handle and it's too big for me and I, I don't know what to do, I'm going to cast that burden upon you. I'm going to trust you to take what I cannot do and leave it with you because you're capable. Number four, rest in the Lord and wait for him. Sometimes that's the hardest part. What are we to do in verse 7? Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. God's not on our timetable. We're on his. And with that being the case, we have to wait. We have to just rest in him at times and say, okay, I don't see the answer just yet, but Lord, I know you have the answer. And Lord, I don't know which way you're directing, but I'm trusting you that you're directing in the right way. And I'm going to rest in you and wait for you to show me clearly what I need to know. You know, it's a liberating thing to know that you can just rest in and wait on God. And it would behoove us to do that this morning. Just rest in God. And then wait on Him. Learn to enjoy the journey and appreciate where God has placed you right now. I think that would help all of us. Find joy in the journey that you're in. Don't try to always get to the next destination. The Lord has you where He wants you to be right now for a specific purpose. Enjoy where you're at. And love where God has brought you. And uh, we need to just enjoy the time of life that we're in. And don't, don't talk down about it and don't say, you know, oh, i got so much going on and, oh, life is just crazy. and Oh, boy, I, I don't know. You know, we, we should have a, a kind of spirit that says, God's good. Oh, boy, I, it's, when people ask us how we're doing, God's good. I'm so thankful for how God's been good to me. And better than, my, better than I deserve, God has been good. I'll be 45 years old this year, and that means I'm halfway or even over halfway there. And I want to enjoy, I just, I said this the other day. I think I was talking to Brooke or something, and there was something that came up, and I, I don't remember what it was. There was something that if, if I allowed it, if I allowed my human reaction to get the better of me, I, I would have kind of become intense about whatever that thing was. And I said, you know, Brooke, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to react that way because, and she didn't do anything wrong. There was something came up and we were having a discussion. And I just said, uh, I want to live the second half of my life less intense than I lived the first half. <laughs> because I've lived with an intensity sometimes that, uh, that is indicative of not trusting the Lord. And it's indicative of trying to do too much myself. So we release it to God. Rest in the Lord. Wait for him. A lot of us need to stop, keep silent, forbear, and patiently wait on him. Now, maybe we need to write that down or take a picture of the screen or something because for me, that's the most powerful part of this message. Stop, keep silent, forbear others especially, and then patiently wait on God. Isaiah 40, 31 says this, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We can wait on Him, and as we do, we'll be increased, we'll be helped, we'll grow stronger in the process, and one day we'll mount up as an eagle with mighty wings that isn't weary, but has learned to wait on God. Now, fifth and finally, notice verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. The verse here doesn't mean that we never get angry. It's a natural human reaction sometimes to become angry about things. But Ephesians 4.26 tells us clearly, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And so, yes, we will feel that emotion of anger from time to time, but it's how we respond to it that matters. And if we lose control of ourselves, then we've failed. If we 
give in and we, you know, yell as loud as we can at someone or something and we show that anger and, uh, you know, or we say something we shouldn't say or we slam a door or we do something that's unbecoming or not right or not uh, in the spirit of Christ. You know what we've done? We've lost. We've lost our powerful testimony. And so the Bible says, cease from anger and from wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Uh, for some of us, if we could allow God to take this vice of ours of anger, uh, we would be so much better and so much usable uh, for his kingdom and for his glory. But that little issue of anger sometimes keeps us very limited and right about the time the Lord's about to promote us or do something uh, wonderful with us or he's about to give us a blessing you know what we do it's like Moses when he takes that Ten Commandments and he breaks it or when he strikes the rock and when he just lo he lost control on several occasions and he didn't make it into the promised land I don't want to have the, the biggest, most important of, moment of my life not happened because I lost my cool and I lost my temper. Now listen, that doesn't mean we're not passionate about things. I think God's people should be passionate. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't uh, speak passionately or with urgency or with fervency about things. I, look, I'm not saying just be a deadbeat marshmallow. That's not the point. But what I am saying is we cannot lose our testimony in the process. Whatever we do, do it with all your might, but don't lose your testimony. Don't become an angry person because an angry person is often a person who's unusable and they're often a person who loses their influence over time. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, we look at the power players in our world and we look at them as people who, uh, you know, can tell someone off or tell someone what to do and no one's getting in my way. I'll climb over everyone to the top. But more often than not, that person ends up in a very miserable place. But the person who learns to love God and love people and not lose their testimony and not lose control of themselves ultimately will win in the end. Be ye angry and sin not. And you know what I think we'll find? If we follow these simple commands, and really they're straightforward here in this passage, we'll live a rather fulfilled life. We'll live a life that is wonderful and truly meaningful. And remember, it all begins by trusting in God. If you trust in the Lord and do well, you know what's going to happen? Uh, you're going to be a person who ultimately knows the Lord, who comes into his family. You'll be saved. You'll have your sins forgiven. And it begins there. And then after that, we can live a truly meaningful, fulfilled life. And I want more fulfillment. I believe we all want more of that. And we don't find that from some self-help book or from some guru or someone who says they have all the answers. We find it by following God at his word and obeying him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Let me ask, do you know the Lord? Because ultimately we can't be fulfilled unless we've placed our faith and trust in him. When the Bible says trust in God, it means that we relinquish our own might, our own power, our own way. And we say, Lord, I'm going to believe you, and I'm going to believe your word in your way. And the Bible says that for by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We're all sinners. But we have to believe that and trust in God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that's to save us. And if you're here this morning, you recognize that you're a sinner. And you're not sure that you've ever trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation. By that I mean 
you acknowledge that you're a sinner before God, and you call upon him to save you. If you can't look back on a time where you know for certain that you've done that, now's the time. Don't let it pass. Would you very quietly be willing to just call upon God right now where you're seated? And would you see yourself as the sinner that you are? And by saying that, I mean we're all in the same boat. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you're willing to acknowledge that, and you also believe that Jesus is God and that he went to the cross, suffered, bled, died, was buried, and rose again for your sins, if you believe that to be true and you want to receive him as Lord and Savior, you can do so right now. Quietly, even in your own heart, you don't have to say it out loud, but say these words to the Lord. Say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I know that I have broken your law. But I believe that Jesus is God. That he was crucified, buried, and that he rose from the grave. Three days later. And I'm trusting in that alone. Right now. To save me. Please come into my life. And help me to live for you. Might there be somebody who would say. Pastor I just prayed that prayer as you said it. Just raise your hand and put it down. I won't call you out or embarrass you. But pastor I just, I just prayed that prayer to the Lord. I just made certain that I. Got it settled once and for all. I called upon him to save me. Lord, thank you for these who are here. Thank you for this message. Help us to apply it. I pray that we would live lives of more fulfillment and more contentment simply by following what this passage tells us. And I pray that we would trust you and that we would delight ourselves in you and commit our way unto you. Help us, Lord. Help us to rest and wait patiently for you and, and not to become angry and to cease from that anger that often sometimes ruins what otherwise would have been something you could have used. Help us. Speak to us now in this time of invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, quietly? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask that Holly would play a verse or two of invitation. And as she does... Let's allow the Lord to speak to us. You can come. You can pray at the front. You can make an altar at your seat. However the Lord might be speaking this morning, you come. might notice we have the, op the windows completely, you know, free of any coverings today. We're in that time of the year where the sun doesn't affect us as much. And that was something else we did yesterday. We brought the drapes up and we took out the little triangle pieces that Cora made so wonderfully. 
And every time we do that now, we're going to say, boy, Cora did a good job on those. <laughs> and that's another way that you delight in the Lord. Use your talents for the Lord. So we took those down and said, boy, Cora did a good job. And when we put them up in the fall, we're going to say the same thing. Cora did a good job on those, you know. And that's how we delight in the Lord. That's how we use our, our talents for the Lord and just uh, are pliable to his will. It's good to see everyone here today. John, good to see you. Would you close us in a word of prayer and dismiss us, please?